Between the two world wars, Berlin was a teeming hub of European culture. The city swarmed with artists and industrialists who were enjoying the cultural renaissance. And with this resurgence came an age of decadence unparalleled in Europe. Berlin was host to a colorful cast of eccentrics who one day became the characters in Vicky Baum's 1930 novel, Mention im Hotel, which was inspired by her experiences working as a chambermaid for two Berlin hotels. The novel was adapted into the Broadway production Grand Hotel, which was financed by Hollywood movie studio MGM. As part of the deal, the studio bought the film rights for $35,000. So when the successful run of the play was complete, the property had already made a virtual profit before shooting a single frame of film. In 1931, MGM studio was controlled by production chief Louis B. Mayer, but MGM's creative leadership fell to Hollywood's undisputed cinematic genius, Irving Thalberg, who Fortune magazine referred to as a flimsy bag of bones held together by a furious ambition to make the greatest movies in the world. Thalberg believed that Grand Hotel had the potential to be a winner for MGM and set about to contrive a hook for the movie. This hook came when he hit upon the idea of using not only a few, but all stars in an ensemble cast, which was a revolutionary idea in 1931. The Hollywood Reporter originally announced comedian Buster Keaton and the role of Kringlein. However, MGM's top star, Lionel Bettimore, was given the part, leaving Thorberg to the task of casting six additional leading roles from MGM's peerless roster of stars. One of the biggest names, not only at MGM, but in motion pictures, was Greta Garbo. By 1930, she had already achieved many successes, including her first talking picture, Anna Christie. Give me a whiskey, ginger ale on the side. And don't be stingy, baby. She was almost unreal, even to people at MGM. I was so surprised because I heard she was a dowdy and didn't care how she dressed and had streaky hair. And on came, and she, she looked like a goddess. She had the longest eyelashes of anybody I'd ever seen. Beautiful long eyelashes that threw a shadow across her eyes. There was always that sense of drama. Thalberg appointed Garbo to the role of the temperamental dancer Grusinskaya. However, Garbo turned the role down igniting rumors that she refused to share the spotlight with another top name star. But these rumors were untrue. At 27, Garbo believed she was too old to play a prima ballerina. But Thorberg was used to handling high-strung actresses and promised to bill her solely by her last name, an honor vested only to such illustrious names as Bernhardt and Duza. But Garbo remained dubious, telling him that she required approval of her leading man. Her choice to play the Beren was former fiancé and co-star John Gilbert, but Gilbert's last few films had failed at the box office. So Thorberg craftily assigned the role to the era's most celebrated stage actor, John Bettimore, who had come to MGM the previous year to star with his brother Lionel in Arsene Lupin. And the Duke of Chamaras. Yeah, then I'm the Queen of Romania. Bettimore was so thrilled at the prospect of working with Garbo that he accepted a three-picture deal in order to play opposite the Swedish star. Another MGM heavyweight appointed to the picture was Wallace Beery, who also rejected his assignment, feeling the part too unsympathetic. Thorberg appeased the headstrong actor with assurances that his would be the only main character to use a German accent, and he accepted the role. Thorberg assigned Joan Crawford the role of Flemchen, the stenographer, but she also hesitated to accept the role, fearing that her best scenes would be cut by the censors. At wit's end, Thorberg assured her the scenes would be filmed in good taste and firmly ordered her to take the part. She complied and was later grateful when the film was a hit, though, as she predicted, many of her scenes were cut in several conservative states in America. One of Hollywood's most prestigious directors, Edmund Goulding, was appointed to the film, as was director of photography, William Daniels. As Thorberg needed to attend to a full slate of projects, he assigned producer Paul Byrne to run the production in his place. Thorberg believed the script was the most important ingredient for the film and spent many hours with Byrne and Goulding hammering out story ideas. The budget was set at $700,000, which in 2004 converts to about 80 million. 
MGM's art director, Cedric Gibbons, was set to the task of creating the sleek Art Deco interiors, for which they created these early sketches. When the stage was set, principal photography commenced in early 1932 with the crowded lobby scenes, under the masterful direction of Edmund Goulding. Nothing ever happened. There was a whirlwind of publicity surrounding the scenes between Garbo and Bedimore, though each was wary of working with the other. He had been told that Garbo was cold and antisocial, and she was told Bedimore was an egomaniacal poseur. So when she was late for the first day shooting, he suspected temperament, until a prop boy told him that Garbo had been waiting outside the stage to escort him on set. And at once she swept in, saying, this is a great day for me. How I have looked forward to working with the great John Berrymore. He kissed her hand and said, my wife and I both think you are the loveliest woman in the world. And thus, a beautiful relationship was born. Crawford would say that Grand Hotel was her high point up until then. She was called upon to match Garbo and the Bedimores and came off smelling like a rose. In rehearsals with Bedimore, Garbo requested the stage be lit with red floodlights to provide a romantic mood. And when shooting those scenes, she barred everyone from the set but director Edmund Goulding and cameraman William Daniels. When she was doing a close-up or a love scene, screens were around the camera. Only the camera poked through, not even the camera crew. Who are you? Someone who could love you, that's all. We had one scene together, and she did nothing. I thought, she has to be the worst actress. And I asked if I could see the rushes, and everything that she thought was on the camera. But to look at, you couldn't see it. She loved the camera, and the camera loved her. The Bedimore garbo chemistry was heating up on the set. Preparing for a scene, he was heard to repeat to her, you are the most entrancing woman in the world. But after Goulding called cut, Garbo threw caution aside and lustily kissed him, saying, you have no idea what it means to me to play opposite so perfect an artist. He was uncharacteristically dumbfounded. Garbo was so taken with Bedimore that she allowed herself to be photographed behind the scenes with him in these famous publicity stills. Her famous line in the fourth reel of the film would cement Garbo's image as the most reclusive star of all time. Well? I want to be alone. This line would be forever associated with Garbo, who took exception with this lonely point of view. I just want to be alone. As it turned out, the reluctant star didn't want to be alone as much as she wanted to be left alone by the press and the public. Lionel Bedimore believed that it was not aloofness, but extreme shyness that hampered Garbo's social skills, and that her unpretentiousness almost amounted to a malady. By the time the principal photography was complete, it is unsure whether the so-called ensemble cast ever assembled at the same time, though this clever mock-up publicity photo would indicate otherwise. On March 11, 1932, Irving Thorberg and Edmund Goulding took a three-hour rough assembly of Grand Hotel to Monterey, California for a preview. The reaction at the Golden State Theater was mostly positive, save one exception. The Hollywood Reporter noted that when Garbo sees the performance of Joan Crawford, there will be some Swedish swearing. Crawford has the feminine meat of the show and how she does take advantage of it. So Thorberg had Garbo's part built up and they shot additional scenes 10 days later. Mr. Mayer would want to see the Hardy pictures and I was the executive of it. And if I didn't think it was ready to be seen and we were going to make some retakes, we were left alone. Thorberg said, Joe, we have to make pictures that will get certain kind of people into the theater who never goes to see a picture. Just two weeks after the retakes had wrapped, Metro Golden Mayer staged an all star premiere for Grand Hotel at Grauman's Chinese Theater in Hollywood. It would be considered one of the greatest opening nights in Hollywood history. MGM's publicity department created Ballyhoo like no other studio. 
Radio MC Conrad Nagel welcomed an extraordinary list of celebrities. Among them were Marlena Dietrich, Edward G. Robinson, Robert Montgomery, Jean Harlow and producer Paul Byrne, Walter Houston, Lou Ayres and Lola Lane, and MGM production chief L.B. Mayer. Director Edmund Goulding was joined by cast members Louis Stone, Jean Hirschholt, Wallace Beardy, Lionel Barrymore, and finally Joan Crawford and husband Douglas Fairbanks Jr. The fans nearly broke through the chains at the arrival of Irving Thalberg, his wife Norma Shearer, and her recent co-star, a newcomer named Clark Gable. MC Will Rogers announced that Greta Garbo herself would make an appearance after the picture. The film began and was, of course, a tremendous hit. But after the movie, it wasn't Garbo, but Wallace Beardy who appeared in full drag, warbling, I want to be alone. The gag was a total flop. True to form, Garbo had spent the evening alone with friends. Grand Hotel would be Hollywood's greatest hit of 1932. The movie would go on to win the Academy Award for Best Picture and is the only Oscar-winning film not to have been nominated in any other categories. Grand Hotel was parodied the same year in MGM's Blondie of the Follies with Mary and Davies and Jimmy Durante. Who are you? Why are you here? <laughs> to breathe the air you breathe. After more than 70 years, Grand Hotel remains a tremendous hit with audiences and holds a place on the AFI's list of the top 400 movies of all time.